Welcome back on board the Starship. And that music video was by Steve McGee. And you can find more of Steve's work on the internet. If you just Google Steve McGee music video, you'll be able to find some of his work on YouTube. And we are joined by the, um, the Starship rodent, Ulysses. Now, some people have suggested that Ulysses here is named after the Greek mythological character. In fact, that's not strictly true. Um, he's named after the cult 1980s television program Ulysses 31, which was actually based on the, on the, on the Greek mythological character. Um, I didn't understand a word of that program. It was very Bob Lazar, um, but it had a great theme tune. Okay, now it's time for the interesting person of the week. And this week, it's Brian, who's an ex-footballer nonetheless, and he's talking about his UFO sighting. My name's uh, Brian Croft and I'm from Chester and about five or six years ago I had an experience um, of actually seeing a, a saucer shaped craft. Um, it was about eight o'clock in the evening and um, I was driving along quite high up on a hill where you can actually see quite a distance of the Cheshire area and um, the Welsh area and I noticed just sort of hovering behind a cloud was a silver disc and originally I assume well it was a plane and but it what drew my attention to it was the, the stillness and it didn't move and then as I kept looking and staring it actually at great speed sort of vertically and I wouldn't estimate whether it would be a mile stopped and then actually just shot off to the right at astronomical speeds and um, I was just blown away and, and actually four or five days later I went into the local shop and I uh, was hovering about looking for a, a, a DVD and there was two elderly gentlemen behind me that ha actually witnessed it and they were actually right beneath it so um, that was one of my sort of uh, first uh, UFO experiences. Hmm, very interesting I think you'll agree. Um, if you suspect that you may be interesting or perhaps have interesting tendencies, then we would like to hear from you. So why not make a YouTube clip, try and keep it under two minutes, and send a, a link to the clip to starship at richplanet.net. And you can talk about anything you like as long as it's interesting. Which brings me to the interesting scientific fact of the week, which is this. If you could drive your car in a straight path, from the surface of the Earth directly upwards, you would arrive here in space in just over an hour. Okay. Do you have any pets, Alan? No, we've got the two dogs, but yeah. they're not pets. Yeah. I've, they're not pets. <laughs> I've met Alan's uh, pets. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> two Rottweilers. We've still got both your hands, have we? <laughs> yeah, still got both my hands. Yeah. I don't think we'll be introducing Ulysses to your no, pets. I don't think so. Okay. Right. Right. Okay, then. Well, let's, let's continue to talk about the Ark of the Covenant because um, I'm absolutely fascinated by it. And one question yeah. I've got for you, Alan. Mm. If we could put a price on the Ark of the Covenant, what, what, what would it be? My opinion would be about two billion. Two billion? Uh, two billion pounds. That's 2,000 million yeah. pounds. Well, you see, when we were starting this research, way before we got to this, we met Lord Jack Brooks in the House of Lords. Mm -hmm. He said, if your research is on the Arthurian side are right, mm -hmm. you could create a tourist industry in South Wales. He said, of at least 20,000 jobs. Mm. Now, I think we can create an industry of far more than 20,000 jobs. And it's not like a factory. Mm -hmm. You can't take it away and put it in India mm -hmm. or somewhere. It's there for good, mm -hmm. permanent. I mean, th this is why I give credence to your um, Art of the Covenant work because of the King Arthur work, you know, which... which to yeah. me, seems 100% plausible. The, the, yeah. the cross, you know, the, the, the graves yeah. that you've un, un, uncovered. I mean, w I think we should take a little bit of a, a look at the, you, you know, the, the method that you used to locate the exact location, mm. which was, we were talking before yeah. the break about the star maps. So yeah. you believe that these ancient mounds are, they're built in the pattern of, of constellations. Yeah, they can't be otherwise. I mean, in, so the West, in the West Wales map, you've got the complete W of Cassiopeia. You've got the scepter of Sisi for mm -hmm. the three in the bend. You so know, there, there's so much of it. Indeed, at Hercules, and yeah, and we you've got uh, Perseus the robber. And they're settled so precisely. 
in the mounds. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's difficult to see any other so, explanation. Have you got any thoughts as to why the ancients used to do that? I mean, these mounds would take a long time to build. They're not little oh, no, these I are mean, not little some of them are yeah. 40 metres high, aren't some they? Some of them are huge, some yeah. are huge, yeah. Fast. So there's no, there's no real, nobody um, really knows why they would do that, you know, just that they did. Well, I think they knew a little bit more about what's about, up there about than we do. Right. I, I think they knew a bit more okay. than we think they did. So, the actual constellation that you thought that the Art of the Covenant would yeah. be buried at is? Well, it, it's got to be within a zone, within the encompass of the entire system, right? Yes. And we think that zone is north of Cardiff, the Ronda. That's the area where it's always been traditional about this chest. Mm -hmm. And, and it's the and constellation of Leo. Well, we thought Leo being the lion was the emblem of Judah. Jerusalem was in Judah. That's where they had the temple. That's where they put the ark and so on. So we thought that was a good bet. So it was really a matter of finding the star Regulus, which is the biggest. There are two first magnitude stars in Leo. One mm -hmm. is Denebola, one is Regulus. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we wanted to say where on the map and Regulus. And mm -hmm. There's a vast mound where Regulus should be, a vast mound. Yeah, I had a look at that last it's night huge. on Google Earth. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, it's a place called Unis, is that? Unis. Uh, Unis. Uh, yeah, um, it's a huge mound, isn't it? I mean, uh, uh, how big is it? It's well, it, it, it's uh, a mound on top of a hill. Okay. And so you've got about a 60 feet addition, mm -hmm. maybe four or five acres. You know, right. Five, uh, and, you know, it's quite a, s a small object, two foot by four foot, the Ark of the Covenant. So yeah. you, you kind of did a survey and found yeah. various things yeah. within the mound. Is that right? Well, no, what, what, what we did first, we located that there were four sumps along the north side. Right, sumps. Which uh, I think I would describe them. Well, the sump describe is, them now. It's yeah. like a, a bowl shaped depression. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a man-made bowl shape in in the side of the hill. Right, about what twelve, underground 12 feet in diameter. Yeah, like that. That. right. Underground chamber always had a hole in the, the floor. Yeah. Right, and they dug a tunnel down. Right, towards the outside of the hill. If that's the yeah. hill, that the tunnel goes down to the outside mm -hmm. of the hill. So water coming into that chamber would run down the drain. Mm -hmm. When it got to underneath the bowl, the the shaft would be underneath the bowl. Mm -hmm. They would make a little tick hole mm -hmm. horizontally. So water would come down and have to flood upwards, mm -hmm. stop it eroding anything away. So that little shaft would be filled with white stones of three types. Mm -hmm. And if for some reason or other, no weeds grow in it. And you find that you've got this plug hole in each one, probably about 18 inches or more wide. Right. So these stones are a special type of stone which the chemical con composition must kill the weeds or stop yeah, it from Yeah, growing. well, uh, they, samples were taken mm -hmm. to the National Museum and to a university, and the geologists established that these stones come from Cornwall, 300 miles mm -hmm. away. So they knew what they were doing. Right. And, and the whole purpose of these yeah. things is to keep whatever is inside there dry. Dry. Right. That's right. That was the purpose. Right. So we knew roughly from where the sumps were, where the chambers might be. Okay. And on the south side of the hill, looking down at Google Earth again, thank mm. you Google, uh, were tram lines. Right. Going, not starting from the top of the hill, mm -hmm. but about a third of the way down. Mm -hmm. And we went around there and there was a lot of rubble going, where right. you, if you dig a tunnel in somewhere, you throw the stuff out, it's going to roll straight down the hill, right. tram lines. Right. So someone had created a tunnel. So we knew where the tunnel was and where the sumps were and we made a pretty accurate guess that there was a mm. band of area between a certain zone that was worth looking at. Right. So you then got... We got Alan Hassel from London, who's, uh, in my opinion, one of the best metal detector types in the world. He's right. the first guy in the world who ever managed to uh, do metal detection underwater. <laughs> mm, right. What a character. Right. Uh, ordinary guy, but uh, good at what he does. And he's got a detector that goes down 30 feet. Mm -hmm. And it'll differentiate between ferrous and non-ferrous metals. Okay. And we located an item four feet by two feet non-ferrous metal, which is the size of the lid of the Ark of the Bible, as in the Bible, mm -hmm. Ark of the Covenant, not the Ark of the Bible. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, you know, that is the correct size. It's non-ferrous metal. It's in the right place. 
And Take it from there. Okay, so you were in contact with the landowners when you were doing this research. Yes, yes, and, oh, yes. you know, yes. I would be there with my shovel digging yeah. it frantically if that was my land. I mean, wh what, did the, what did the landowners say to you about this? Well, I think they're typically Welsh farmers and, uh, you know, they earn a living from selling <laughs> breeding sheep. And they, they're good businessmen. They've got other businesses as well. Yeah. I think they think we're slightly mad, right? if not completely gone. It's a big shock for them. And I think they've made the mistake of consulting some of the experts, mm -hmm. you know, people in a university or so, who've never thought of doing anything in this direction right. and have no knowledge whatsoever of what. Yeah. I think there's a bit of, oh my God. The other thing they don't want is if a big fuss was made and there's nothing there, then they're going to have all sorts up there on the. Yeah, the, be, be, and because weekends, the implications you know, they don't want them on their land. So let's say for the the Ark of the Covenant is there. Yeah. The implications are what to the the history of Christianity and you know the where does how would we have to rewrite things? Well, Christianity starts off in Britain in 37 AD, the last year of Tiberius for a start. It doesn't start in Rome. Right. It's taken to Rome in 51 AD by the family of Caranach. Right. So that stands. That is a fact. Cardinal Bronius, Cardinal Alford, right. and so I that could quote you a whole list of flies in the of face of, of what would you know the, the mainstream historians would. would well, it, it's, would it's no. It, 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 if the mainstream historian does any historical research, then yeah. he'd have to agree with us. Okay. If they don't do any research, which mm -hmm. is most of them, they just read each other's work. And, and the other thing, if the ark... It's the a fact, it's been admitted by the Bishop of Rome anyway. Right. If, if the ark was found there, it would possibly be some kind of unifying yeah. thing for, for, for um, Islam and Christianity? Yes, I, I think so. I mean, the, the Muslims definitely believe in Moses, uh -huh. and so do the Jews and so do the Christians. Uh, there's a lot of row going on at the moment with uh, certain... I, let's call them misguided people try to want to dig underneath the Temple Mount and go under the mosque at the, yes, you know, yes. in Jerusalem. There'd be no need to do that because it's not there. Yeah. And therefore, you know, you might have a, a settlement of that contentious issue for a start. Yeah. They might find they've got something in common. Yeah. yeah. You it could unify some of yeah, the religions. Yeah, if you look at what you've got are, in common, you rather know, than what your differences are. I mean, I, I personally think that there are people who are trying to divide and conquer, you know, the, the religions of the world and, and, and put Muslims against Christians and, and you know, yeah. create uh, wars. Well, it, it's all, religion has always resulted in wars. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it, it's time to stop it. Mm -hmm. The main thing that I would say is that uh, this is not the only thing that we found using this system. Mm -hmm. The 13 Mabinogi tales, right? Mm -hmm. and the last three are about knight errants going on their journeys. Mm -hmm. Peridot is steel shirt, is Jupiter, going around the stars, okay. the planet. Right. Uh, Geraint is Mars, going around on journeys through the stars. Right. You see? Okay. They're not knights as we know them on Earth, charging around the forest. You know? I uh, see. Yes, and yes. Therefore, these stories tell us where to go for other things. Right. So a planet, for example, on, that, on your mound map, would not be fi in a fixed position. No. It would be moving, no, moving around no, as, no. as they do. No, no. Yeah. It, 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 you follow the journey on land, what's okay. happened in the sky, you can follow it on land. So we found other things. Mm -hmm. We went in search. Anglo-Saxon Chronicle says that, you know, and they, the British, gathered together all the treasures of Britain in one place and buried them, and no man has ever seen them since. Okay. And we know where they are. And, and we know where they are. Just, <laughs> just, just to finish, Alan. I mean, yeah. obviously, we could probably do a whole series of programs on your well, information in, in, in all of these books. Yeah. Well, you know, is, would somebody not have perhaps dug that thing up behind closed doors if, after you've revealed the location? Or do you, do you think it's still there? Oh, it's still there. And so what are the likelihood of it, of it being dug up? Or do you think it's, the lid's been closed on this? Or? I think the government has to take a hand. I think, I think authority has to step in. Okay. Uh, firstly, if just for job creation, mm -hmm. if just for wealth creation on a permanent basis, yeah. and I depressed mean, area. It, it would revolutionise the tourist and oh. uh, tourism industry of Wales, wouldn't it? In 1986, we had the unedifying sight of two large coaches going around parts of Wales, mm -hmm. full of politicians and bureaucrats and about 12 Japanese gentlemen. 
right. who said, give us 150 million pounds of your money, uh -huh. we will build a factory with it and employ 5,000 people, right. make motor cars. In mm. the event, the factory went to Sunderland, not to South Wales. Right, right. No, and it only ever employed 3,000. Right. We haven't asked them for a cent. Uh -huh. Right? And we'll create thousands of jobs. Mm -hmm. All we're asking them to do is dig a hole. Yeah. Now, there's a big difference, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's, it's, it's just blows my mind that they, that they won't look at that and, and take you seriously, Alan. And, you know, we'll have to invite you back to, to you know, discuss some more of your work. But yeah, really, well, thank you very much indeed for coming in, Alan. It's fascinating. I need to read some of your books and expand my knowledge of history. So thanks very much indeed. It's a pleasure. Okay. Right, and just a quick announcement before we go. Um, we're possibly looking at having a studio audience for the Rich Planet Starship, so if you want to be beamed up onto the craft, if you let us know by emailing starship at richplanet.net. And um, just a quick word to keep your eyes on the skies, your feet on the ground, and tell all your friends about this show.